This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. G'day, everybody. This conversation with Lindsay took place ahead of her Australian tour in December 2018. The chat has long been available as an episode of the Scars and Guitars podcast since December 12 of the same year. Now, Lindsay has since left Cradle of Filth, as if you don't know that, and as if a lineup change with that band is any surprise. I'll also add that her predecessor, somebody who I almost had a conversation with, she didn't turn up for a couple of scheduled interviews, Annabelle, she's also left the band. Lindsay is just lovely during this chat. We discuss how she got a start in the music industry and share a rather ironic joke, it's gotta be said at this point, about why the band is dubbed Danny and the Filths, amongst other subjects. So here she is. This is a chat from December 2018 with Lindsay Schoolcraft. Lindsay calling. How are you going? Ah, I'm really good. How are you? Yeah, I'm not too bad. I'm not too bad. I hope it's. Uh, what time is it over there on Friday night in Canada? It's 6 p.m. right now. It's already dark. It's the shortest day of the year, so it got dark like over an hour ago. <laughs> oh, God, the old, the old winter solstice, God, it certainly brings out the crazies, doesn't it, though? It brings out the good stuff, though, man. I've been <laughs> feeling really good today, so it is what it is. And after this, it's like, okay, we're halfway through it. Summer's coming. Woo! Not really, though. We get, like, we got two more months of dread out here, so. <laughs> oh, my God. I've got extended family that live in Canada. My, my sister-in-law actually lives in Vancouver. She's, she's back over here. Okay. She had a problem with She's lucky. Well, sorry, go on. Well, she had a problem with a visa because her, her father passed away. My father-in-law passed away, oh, so she had to come. Sorry to hear that. Oh, that's, that's all good. He, he was sort of on his last legs anyway. So it was a bit of a, a blessing and a mercy, if you understand mm-hmm. these things, you know. And uh, mm-hmm. but she can't get back in, so she's staying with back us. Back into Canada or back into Australia? Back into Canada as a work. She can go. Ah. She can go over there on a, on a like a holiday visa, but she's actually got a job over there in logistics on uh, sending trucks around Vancouver Island. But she, oh, that's so strange. Yeah, I look and, and she's she's apparently in this big long queue. I think Canada and Australia's immigration laws mirror each other. Very similar. A little bit, yeah. Yeah, we've got a similar constitution, apparently. Westminster. Well, system. the Queen owns us, so. <laughs> Indeed, she does. I'd love to know how much of our money's going toward her and her cronies. <laughs> yeah, and her, her feeding her corgis and so she can have her New Zealand eggs every morning for breakfast. Oh, God. Yeah, it's like that, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it is like that. Yeah, yeah. she's living her best life. <laughs> Yeah, she's pretty, uh, she's getting up there in age, isn't she? But as far as I can remember, she, she's always looked the same. Yeah, I think yeah. she's a vampire. Well, one of you, my theories. <laughs> have you heard the conspiracy theories about, I mean, of course you would have, okay, but you know the reptilian oh, thing? Oh, yeah. You know, oh, then, yeah, I was just thinking of that. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of all of those, those you know, uh, ley lines and uh, what are those things in the sky that they reckon, um, God, uh, any other time? What, like UFOs? No, the um, where they they they're clouds, but um, they've got aluminium and heavy metals in them. What do they call that? Sorry, any other time I don't know what it's called. I don't remember. I don't know if I've heard this conspiracy theory. I've heard a few. (laughs) There's some things I do believe. The ones that are like practical, that like that, like that, that totally could be going on. I believe it's probably going on, but it's like lizard people. I don't know, man. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit far fetched. And there's these videos on on YouTube of Rihanna, someone superimposed reptile eyes on her and made them blink and stuff. It's like, guys, we know Photoshop and video editing exists these days. Yeah, Come good on. job, guys. Way to try to fool us, but not. <laughs> no way. No way. Hey, we uh, let's talk about this tour that you've got coming up. So I'm, I'm going to be a punisher for a moment. So excuse me whilst I do. This. You can do what you want. It's all good. Um, where's Brisbane? Because that's where I'm from. (laughs) Oh, okay. You know what? I feel really bad because I was hoping it would extend to Brisbane and Adelaide and it didn't. And I felt like such a jerk, but that was just the best we could do. But like, you know, if we try it again in the future, we're definitely not going to miss out on you guys. Sorry, I don't don't mean to be a punisher because I know it's No, it's okay. You're like one of like 30 people (laughs) who's asked me, so... It's all good. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a good thing. I was speaking to Fred from uh, Sinsanium and also Dragon Force about the same thing. When, when he and Sinsanium came down, they only played Sydney and Melbourne, and uh, he, he got punished a bit too by us Queenslanders and people in Perth and Adelaide, um, and saying, why aren't you going down? He goes, look, you know, we are, we are trying, and it's, it's just one of those things. We can only play two shows. And he explained that when he went to the UK, 
they played London and I think maybe Birmingham, that's it. And they've got a lot more population yeah. over there. So I said, yeah, yeah, I know, but we're so far bloody away from everything. You might as well maximise the, the gigs that you've got when you, when you come down. But it, it is a nice feeling to be wanted, though, isn't it? It is, yeah, you know, and it's just, and then for next time, you know, I know what to do, so I don't miss out on anyone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now tell me, the shows, uh, are these, I understand in Melbourne you've got a DJ set and you'll also be playing yes. the harp, but yes. are you, are you, is there a live band around you as well? Are you bringing the rock, so No, it's just me. We tried in the beginning to bring my guitarist and there wasn't the budget for it. Yeah. So he was a little bummed out, but he understood entirely. Um and then, uh, you know, we're trying to hopefully for next time he can come with and it can be, you know what I mean? It can, but it was one of those things where, you know, even after I tried to put my own money into it and, you know, we did our best, it still was just like a very expensive vacation for him. And I didn't want to do that to him, but he understood he's been really supportive. So maybe next time he'll come with me, but, it, you know, I would love to bring my whole band that would be the goal <laughs> fair enough yeah and, and look you, you obviously are aware that you've got fans down here you know cradle of filth fans and fans of yours individually yeah. so do we are we one of your strongest territories if not your strongest territory um yeah it's strange like i've got this like for some reason like like australia there's like so many fans there are so many fans in mexico um where's like in germany it's crazy there's just like these little pockets of like you're really famous here and i'm like whoa and i mean i'm from the toronto area and the montreal area here in canada so like of course i have lots of friends and fans there right you know okay. part of those scenes for a long time okay so you obviously speak french as well then i suppose like most oh, oh heck no oh, no i only okay. know like no well the problem here is really it's really weird um so when the French came over here and colonized in what is now known as Quebec, mm. they that was 400 years ago, and they have their own version of French, which is like it evolved from old medieval, and it's considered to be almost very slangish. Where so it's called Quebec, uh, Quebecois, where the okay. francophone, which is the language in France, evolved. So it's two entirely different versions, and it's so ass backwards here. In school, they teach you francophone, and then when you go try to speak to Quebecois, it's like it's just a nightmare. So that's why a lot of us gave up. <laughs> okay, oh, that makes a lot of sense. That puts yeah, that sort of you know puts the jigsaw yep. puzzle together. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, right. it's very interesting. I was reading not too long ago, but apparently there's a colony of Australians. So keep in mind, we are a colony ourselves. But there is a colony yes. of Australians. A bunch of convicts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in Sydney, Sydney and definitely Sydney and Melbourne is like that. Yeah, yeah. So we. Uh, <laughs> don't tell them I said that, but yeah. <laughs> um, oh, you know, I just got to rub some salt in the wounds there. What can I, what can I say? <laughs> Oh, look, yeah, I, I used to play uh, rugby as a kid and we used to have schools come and tour from England and as it was the first time I'd ever been called a convict or ever heard anybody actually oh, refer no. to us as convicts. Like as a, I wasn't sure whether they were doing it as like a ribbing, like a, hey, you're just a bunch of convicts or whether it was like you scumbag convicts, we are British and we are better than you sort of thing. It was really hard to work out from their sense of humour. Whether right. I know Brits are really cold and dry and, oh, my God, they're horrible. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you've got a bloody tour with them, though. How do you do it? How do you not murder them? I honestly have just numbed out the really bad sense of humor and dad jokes. Like, when they start thinking they're being funny, I am just stare at them blankly and I'm like, unless it's a pun or it's a super clever scenario joke like or a play on words, I'm just like don't just like I'm not listening you know what I mean because they just yeah. keep going and it's not even funny and they tell like the same jokes over and over again and I'm just like what is going on but I love them <laughs> they are my family Richard, you know? Richard must be I had a really good conversation with Richard about 12 <laughs> months ago or so but he sounds like he's the guy that you could probably get along with the easiest in the band am I right in, in saying that? yeah him and I really get along he is the biggest music fan I've ever met in my life. He is still such a humble music fan and he's such yeah. a theory nerd. He, you know, he, my favorite thing that he ever did is he just like, we put on Michael Bolton's, um, how can we be lovers if we can't be friends? <laughs> he sat there and dissected the whole song for me. And I was just like, Rich, I'm just blown away by your knowledge of music. Cause he's an educator too. And I teach as yeah. well. I teach vocals, um, uh -huh. to the best of my ability. Um, so, you know, yeah, me and Rich really get along. We can have a lot of really cool conversations. He's a very, like, he's just a very cool guy to chat with. You know what I mean? But he still does like getting involved in his dad jokes for some reason. 
Oh, so. yes. Oh, he's got to, he's got to <laughs> do what he, he does. And I'll tell you, the other person that I spoke to, I'm, oh, you might not have met him, but was Stuart Anstis, who was Cradle's guitarist in the late 90s. I had a, oh, yeah, I remember hearing about Stuart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I had a four-hour conversation with him, and he's a really, really nice guy. He's been, he's, you know, it's 20 years ago, or 20 years since he's been out of the band or so, but I think mm-hmm. uh, there's a lot of reverence out there, as you're probably aware, and you probably see the reactions when you're up on stage for Cradle's early material, the stuff off. Uh, well, dust. that's the thing. I mean, we, like, you know, it's really, okay, there's a big, there's a big thing about to come out of my mouth. Um, so, <laughs> you know, the Cradle, I feel like, and this is just me being a fan and also a member of the band, you know, I feel that Cruelty, Dusk, Midian, like those are, those are our three strongest albums. Those are beautiful albums. Those are just like, those are the classics. I mean, there's stuff before, yes. And, you know, we're never going to like, you know, maybe, maybe we will write something, but like, you know, to, to get back to that, I don't know. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I, I don't know, like as the current lineup, you know, we'll, working on the new album in the new year we have a new fresh approach i was really proud of hammer of the witches i think the guys did an amazing job with cryptoriana yeah um and i love this lineup two consecutive albums together and now we're gonna have a third consecutive album we've been together almost five years um that's something really really special and that's the thing we just want to keep that alive and we want to give the fans something that do you know what I mean? That they, they love yeah. the old stuff. And that's the thing. Like, those lineups were legendary. Those albums are legendary. Will we ever do anything like that again? I don't know. If we don't, I'm not upset. If we do, hey, hurrah. But, you know, I'm just very, I'm very grateful that I get to be part of such a legendary band. And even in just a small way. But then I found out on Twitter recently, a fan brought to my attention, I'm the longest running keyboardist in the band. I'm yeah, like, Jesus, how yeah. did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> so, not the longest running female singer. I got to beat Sarah by 12 years or something. So, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, well look, yeah, it, it's. Cradle is known as a band up until recently because this lineup seems to have, uh, it's become, I would say, if you don't mind me saying this, like in the fans' eyes, probably the band's, probably the fans' second favourite lineup outside of the, I wouldn't say the foundation lineup, but the one that had Stuart and Gian or John as they called them, and maybe Les uh, and also. Les, he's. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That line up there. And and the comment that I made to uh, Richard was that I really felt like Cryptoriana was the strongest album that the band had put out potentially since um, since uh, Cruelty. Wow, and thank you. That means a lot. Yeah, oh, look, it's a, it's a fantastic album. And look, I, I must acknowledge that I'm 40 years of age, so I was around for when Vampire came out and this stuff, but I sort of went away from metal for about 15 years or so. And no, no worries happen. <laughs> yeah, you know how it is. I got, I'm a musician too, but I play funk and disco music and covers. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> so I'm um, very cool. I look very normal and all the rest of it, but I have. Uh, but metal's always been my uh, my go to, if you like. It's my home home genre, if you like. So yeah. I hear you. Yeah, you know what it's like, and you so I don't even justify myself to anybody. I don't feel like they talk. I've got two kids. I'm married. I don't care anymore. Really, I'm just going to be me, you know. And yeah, good. As long as you're happy and you're being you, that's the most important thing, right? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. You got to yeah. you got to do what makes you happy, you know. And uh, one thousand percent. You know, but uh, but look, this this album, Cryptoriana, it's it's. Do you, do you get that feedback from you know the fans? I'm talking about the average punter that turns up with the long hair and the whether they've got the wristbands on and the stuff these days or not as other, otherwise. But do you get that <laughs> feedback from them at say fan signings and stuff that they really dig that album? Yeah, we got a lot of really positive feedback from the last two albums. Like we were really nervous about Hammer of the Witches because it was our first album together as this lineup and like mm. we were like oh man we can't let people down it was the first time like a full lineup wrote an album together and god knows how long i don't remember and <laughs> it, it was just like the day the day before like i don't think any of us slept we were all texting each other from the four countries that we're from and we're just like jesus <laughs> christ it drops tomorrow oh god and then i'll never forget we released um right wing of the garden triptych and you know, we went and played Grass Pop and we played it live and literally people were singing along with me. It only been out for like, oh God, maybe a few weeks. And I almost started crying. I couldn't believe it. Mm. Like people were actually singing those lines with me and then they just lost it when we bursted into that song. And I'm like, Jesus, like what is going on? It was just, you know, and the fans have been so, they love it. They're really loving the last few albums. So, you know, now we're really getting into the mindset of like, 
you know, production wise and soundscapes atmosphere really as this lineup, I think we're really going to move forward with uh, something, some some interesting things on the next album. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's been, it's been interesting to watch from afar Cradle's Cradle's evolution, if you like. And something that I talked about with Richard was the contribution of all of the the various band members and stuff, because there is a perception out there that it's it's down. I think I think back in the day it was called Danny and the Filths, but it's not like that at all, really, as far as the musicians are concerned. You guys do a lot of. I mean, you personally do a lot of writing and contribution toward the finished product. Yeah, definitely, especially our drummer too, and then the rest of them. Yeah, it's uh, we still joke and call ourselves Danny and the Filths just because <laughs> it's funny. Um, you know, we we always joke. We're like, oh my god, what did we call? We had a, like we had the same kind of funny names for Demu Borkir and Behemoth, but now um, yes. like there's like Adam and the Nurgles, and like we just had like we just <laughs> we just joking like like that's the thing. You have to be able to make fun of yourself, and you're like, you know. It's fine. I understand, but I understand with the long history and Danny not having the lineup that stuck kind of thing. I get it, but I think he's really lucky to have us. We're we're a group of really down to earth, real people who are yeah. hardworking and care about the music. We're not about the money and the fame. At the end of the day, I mean, it's nice to be able to pay your bills. Let's be real, but it's you know, good. um, yeah. we just want to do what's best for this project and whatever comes in return. Cool. Um, I think some of us are just literally in it for like you know, some of them are just like I just want their credit and their experience, and that's cool too. There's nothing wrong with that mm. um i love the i love the experience and the learning that comes with it and um yeah it's uh you know whatever danny and the filth sure i mean it is danny's band at the end of the day and we gotta mm. make boss man happy so you know <laughs> but he's really happy with us we're in a better place these days you know i feel like he's really found some self-love and peace within himself the past while and i think he's doing better so Okay, so that's a good thing too <laughs> yeah well look it's a cradle of filth are, are, are a revered band and yeah. it's, it's one of the most instantly recognizable band logos out there. And I know it looks, <laughs> it looks like um, it's on fire, but it's Middle Eastern. I don't know. It's yeah. really <laughs> the first time I saw it. I couldn't. I don't think I, like I couldn't read it. Now I can read it. But you know what I mean. <laughs> like when I was in high school, I'm like, what the hell is that? <laughs> oh, I look. Being in my forties, in the nineties, when you had to buy Metal Maniacs magazine and maybe trawl, you know, dial up internet and find bands. And it was really yeah. hard to determine which were the good bands and which the which were the good and the bad bands, if you like, because you couldn't listen to a lot of this stuff instantly. It took too long right. to download stuff. And we had a... Oh. Re- yeah, remember that? Remember a dial up internet? How long it took to download Well, and you stuff? guys have it so rough in Australia. Your internet is still slow there, from what I'm hearing. It's uh, all... It, to be honest with you, it depends on your political persuasion because it's a political hot topic, that one. Now, okay. <laughs> I'm talking to you on a 4G device, right? So we've got very, very good mobile coverage here. In, I've in, heard about that, yeah. yeah. In urban environments. and because Canada and Australia are very similar in the massive land masses um, yes. and very sparse population, which is basically 90%. I think, I don't know what the figure is, but I think it's above 90% of Australia's population lives in urban areas. So, mm-hmm. as you know, you've been here many times. The myth of the Australians living like Crocodile Dundee is just bullshit. We all live in bloody cities. And we're very oh, that's the thing. People think, like, I have a dog sled team and I live in an igloo. <laughs> it's okay. I get it. <laughs> Look, these things, these cliches come up, and it's nice to sort of play up on them from time to time. But we had, oh, yeah. We had, um, oh, God, I'm, I'm not talking about politics, by the way. I'm just sort of talking about the background oh, about our, our internet thing, which is we've got this thing called the National Broadband Network. and. I used yes. to work for Australia's largest telecommunications carrier, which is called Telstra. I used to be an account executive for them for many years, and I've only just stopped wow. so, so as I can do journalism at uni because uh, I'm having like a career. I'm calling it my midlife crisis, but it's not really. It's a career reinvention, if you like. And uh, there you go. I like that much better. <laughs> so it's got a much better ring to it, isn't it? You know, even though yes. I'm, I'm at uni in lectures with the 18 year olds, and I'm clearing their age by about 22 years, but they they accept me as one of their own, which is nice. Good, you know? <laughs> good. I'm but, glad to hear that. But the uh, the internet thing, it just really depends on where you, where you are. Um, so you, you you can get good internet usually wherever you are. You've just got to pay for it. That's all, and that's where it becomes. A political issue because of course a lot of people are very uh have that socialist mindset of it should be given to people because it's a human right that sort of thing so it's it, a basic necessity yeah it is yeah I, I i totally agree yeah it's a basic necessity because god god help i mean you're basically off the grid if you don't have the internet in 2018 don't you and that's the thing it, it needs to be used as an emergency response network yeah yeah that's right yeah it's yeah. very important on that front yeah 
no doubt about that. So, hey, just a question yeah. question about you and your, have I got two minutes left? Is that cool? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Well, how did you get started playing music? I'm, I'm curious as to your journey up to this point. Oh, well, thanks for asking. Um, well, you know, I was raised on Disney, definitely. <laughs> um, so that's kind of where my singing came from. But uh, my dad is a very talented guitarist and singer. Um, he had, you know, he had a pretty short-lived music career, but, you know, instead he met my mom and had me and my sister. So um, he showed me guitar at a very young age. He started teaching me guitar at eight. And I could play, like, some country and sing, and I that country twang still comes out in my voice sometimes. I can't help it. Cool. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, I took some piano lessons when I was younger. I mean, I definitely forgot it all until I took it up again at 21. But, uh, you know, things change. Um, you grow up, you go through these phases. And then when I was 15, I decided I really want to do music. I got a bass guitar for my birthday, had an all-girl um, punk band. Nice. That's when I really started writing music, learning bass guitar. That was really my introduction to music. And then at 21, I just had this uh, crazy, like, I don't know, I'm like, I'm going to learn opera and learn classical piano. And the the album, there's a lot, there was a lot of artists at the time that pushed me to do that. But I think it was like Evanescence is the open door that really pushed me in that direction. Mm. That's a very pinnacle uh, album in my my life uh, but there's a lot of other in, outside influences and um yeah and then i decided i'm gonna go to the conservatory and then i ended up in university for only like one semester and then cradle phil snatched me up but that's okay um you know so i mean and i'm still learning now now i'm kind of on my free time uh, pursuing um vocal teaching on the side and, and different vocal technique and mm. communication and vocal health um that's like a huge thing for me so yeah, I've just been slowly learning that on the side. I had a, I've had about six students this year come every other week, and it's been it doesn't feel like work. It's just been a very rewarding job yeah. when people are passionate about what they do, and you can give that back to them. So yeah, I mean, and I'm teaching myself the harp. That's been interesting. Um, right about that. You know, yeah. I probably should get lessons. I'm probably developing a lot of bad habits I don't even know about, but here we are. So yeah, um, <laughs> you know, I I love music. I'm definitely keep going to keep pursuing it um and educating myself i'm 32 now i'm sure by the time i'm 40 you know i always have this joke <laughs> i have this joke with my boyfriend and i'm just like yeah when i'm a silver fox i'm gonna go back to university <laughs> and become a professor and he's like babe you do you whatever you know yeah. so i don't know we'll see like music's always going to be in my life but there's also the thing is like you know the more i know the more i realize i don't know but also the more i know the more jaded i get so i'm trying to yeah. like find the happy balance <laughs> That's so true what you just said. Yeah, yeah, it's so true. Yeah. Yeah. I know. It's the thing about, because you're evidently a very smart human being and you are schooled (laughs) and you do get the technical side of music as well. It's not really something that I've ever, it's, maths was never my strong point, so therefore the musical and technical theory wasn't. So I just, I just. Oh, I hated theory. I I cried my way through it, complained, moaned. You asked my vocal coach out here. She was like, (laughs) getting you to do theory was like pulling teeth. I'm like, I know. It's hard though, isn't it? It's so boring, and it's a lot of the time. It's so black and white. Yeah. You know, I hate it. (laughs) Yeah, and it's and I know I don't I don't necessarily bind to the theory that some musicians have put forward, which is that if you learn theory, it puts a cage around you. You're thinking, you're playing. It's like, well, no, I do think there's a lot of advantages to understanding it because then you can yeah you understand majors, minors, and then the different modes and all the rest of it, and you can really interpret things in a different way. Yeah, and it's like, I believe that if you, you know, you, you, some, you, you um, what is it? If you rely on theory to finish your compositions, I think you're lazy. That's just me. Yes. You know, you feel it and you know what you already want to do. Forget about theory. But yeah, when you're going back and going over it again and uh, studying it, like analyzing it, and you do need to add that diminished seventh or whatever the heck you're trying to throw in (laughs) it's important to know you know it's very important to know but yeah I I still have this theory I haven't proven it yet but I think that the way music has been mapped out or the way it evolved to like document theory I think it happened that way because it was just kind of an exclusive thing for rich people and that's what generated the income for teachers is like well if you want to learn music you have to learn how to document it this way but I don't think it works for everyone you know what I mean? If, if every, I give, um, I'm very interesting 
Um, my brain gives like every number and every letter a color and that's how I remember it oh, wow. um, okay. because I have dyslexia. So when I'm looking at sheet music, I actually have given every note its own color. Holy moly. Just, okay. Yeah, I know I'm yeah. a weirdo. <laughs> no, that's fantastic. Yeah. There's something to that. Someone, I was talking to an artist, a hip hop artist from Melbourne who has called herself TRQS, which is turquoise, because she talks, it's got a nice. technical term where where music is associated with colours, and she was talking to me about it, and she was writing that way, nice. or she was approaching it writing that way. It sounds like you're doing that, the same thing. Yeah, yeah, you know, sometimes when I listen to a song, I'm like, this song is blue, this song is orange, this song, is, yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. I've met a few other musicians who've told me that too. Wow, okay. Mm -hmm. All right, I better let you go. Thank you so much for the, the conversation. I wish I could get to yeah. one of the shows. But it's just... I know, I, I feel like you and I could talk forever. Thank you for this interview. It was really, you asked some really good questions and I really enjoyed chatting with you, so thank you. No, it's a pleasure. Good luck with everything. I mean that, really good luck <laughs> with everything. You, you are very thank talented. Thank you so much. Excellent artist. Oh, you're so, so sweet. Um, thank you, and you as well. Take care, enjoy your 40s and your family and you know, keep living your best life. You sound like you're doing all right. <laughs> There she is, ladies and gentlemen, the lovely Lindsay Schoolcraft. I enjoyed that chat with her, and I will absolutely hit her up again for round two. She was still in Cradle of Filth at the time of that conversation, if you need a timeline. She's been out of the group a couple of years now, and uh, I know for a fact, without knowing for a fact, if you know what I'm saying, but she must have a story to tell. She must have a bunch of stuff that she would like to share about her time in Cradle of Filth. I just hope I'm the one that she does it with so as I can share it with you. So if you like that chat, there are many more just like it over at scarsandguitars.com underneath the menu item, Cradle of Filth Conversations. I'm talking about chats with the great Stuart Anstis. Almost four hours, actually. It's dead on four hours of conversation with the great Stuart Anstis. Ben Ryan, he was superb. Damien Gregori, Greg Moffat, aka Damien Gregori, Nick Barker, a big one with him. Paul Alenda, Danny, he features. He was my he was the first person I spoke to. Out of all of the Cradle the Filth alumni or otherwise. Richard Shaw, you just heard Lindsay. On the radar, Robin. Robin Graves, or Eagleston is his real name. Les Smith, there's a few more, there's a few more there. Paul Ryan, Was Sargentson, yep, I hope it all happens because I'd love to write that book. Many of you who tune into my chats with the members of Cradle of Filth alumni will know that I'm very keen on writing the Cradle of Filth Chronicles focusing on the 90s epoch, 1994 to 1999, sharing the good oil about just what went on when they created those magnificent albums, Dusk and Her Embrace, Cruelty and the Beast, and even the EP from The Cradle to Enslave, the missed opportunity, really, that one. So my name's Andrew Mackay-Smith, and I'm the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast series. Please do stick around because I want to tell you all about my book. Until next time, it is a very goodbye for now, though. Cheers. This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. I've been the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast since 2017. The first musician I interviewed for the show was David Vincent from Morbid Angel, and things have just snowballed from there. In all, I've posted almost 650 podcast episodes featuring conversations with many of the leading lights of rock, heavy metal, and beyond. It just got to a point where I thought, I need to write a book about all this, so that's exactly what I did. In Scars and Guitars Volume 1, you'll read a heap of deep reveals and commentary, such as Des Fafara talking about Cold Chamber and why the band will never return. You know, if you're a, a band just starting out, you need to hear me. Do not start a band with partners. Ever. Yeah, wise words there. Sage advice, mate, for anybody. Don't ever, because I, I can't go do Cold Chamber right now unless I get others involved. Phil Anselmo talks about the episode in his career, which gives him the greatest sense of accomplishment. I think the staying power of the, the fans and the staying power of the I, of the songs, you know, whether it's Pantera, Down, or Super Joint, the fans remember the songs. Alex Skolnick from Testament confirms it, yes. Playing the guitar in Ozzy's band is anything but an ordinary gig. 
Will Silenos from Demu Borgir write a book? Pa from Sabaton gives advice to people who want to start a band. Look at the team around you, look at the bandmates. If, uh, if the guys want to be on the stage, then it's all cool. If the guys want to be backstage, then it's not going to be cool. Current and former members of Cradle of Filth discuss the band's seminal 90s material. Read about the reaction to George Lynch and Mark from Suicide Silence's comments when they throw shade at then-President Donald Trump. We have this idiotic monster, you know, this egotistical, self-aggrandizing, complete piece of shit in there. I, 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 just, I just can't understand how we've gotten to this place. And yeah, we kicked a hornet's nest with Sepultura. Percussive overlord Gene Hoagland talks about recording with Chuck Schuldiner. Chuck was always, um, you know, he was, he was very, you know, very open-minded, and and he was into having his his musicians that were playing with him just reach out for for the best stuff that they had. Phil Campbell from Motorhead discusses what it takes to get sober. John Five answers his critics who dismiss his tenure with Marilyn Manson. You know, my name is John Five, and Manson gave me that name, and um, I had some of the best years of my life in that band and, and learned a lot. And we get the lowdown on Trey Zagtoth from those who would know, including his mother. All across Scars and Guitars Volume 1, there are moments of tension, relief, tragedy, exhilaration, and throughout it all, you'll obtain insight that I believe no one else has managed to obtain from many of your favourite artists. So treat yourself. Scars and Guitars Volume 1 is currently available as an ebook with a print edition on the horizon. Follow the links attached and download a sample. I'm sure you'll be compelled to read the whole book.